Okay, so how do you write a practical report? Well, here on the left-hand side, I've got the practical report assessment design criteria. So this is the information about how to write your report. And then over on this side, I've got an example of a practical report written by a student. So we need to use headings in our prac report. So first of all, a title. So over here we have a title. This one's called Factors Affecting Enzyme Activity. Then the next, the first section is called the abstract. The interesting thing about the abstract is you write it last. Uh, so you come back to it at the end of your prac and write it and it's a brief summary, three or four sentences. All it does is state the hypothesis, how you tested it, and your conclusion. And so if you read this abstract, you'll see that it does exactly that. It states the hypothesis, how it was tested, and then that the conclusion was that the results obtained supported the hypothesis. So that's the abstract. It gives away the whole prac in two or three sentences. Then we've got the introduction. So the introduction has uh, about four components. The first one is the background theory. So because this practical is about enzyme activity, the background theory is about enzymes. So you have to think about what your prac is about and then you'll be able to work out what the background theory is that you'll talk about. But it's the biology that's involved in that experiment. Uh, you need to state your testable hypothesis. So the testable hypothesis stated for this prac is down below the background theory. It is here. The hypothesis is that the ground liver and potato samples will produce more bubbles than the fresh liver and potato samples. So it's a prediction of what they believe is going to happen. Then they need to identify the variables in the experiment. So the variables need to be classified as independent or dependent. That's where you can use your dry mix. The dependent variable is the result. So in this experiment, it was the amount of bubbles produced. The independent variable is the one that is manipulated. So in this experiment, it was the surface area of samples, cube or ground. Now, it depends on your experiment as to what the independent and dependent variables are. You'll need to think about what is the thing that you manipulated, that's the independent, and what is the thing that the results were, that will be the dependent. After that, you need to then classify all of the factors that needed to remain constant. So the best way to do that is to look at the independent variable. That's the thing that you purposely manipulated. And then think of everything else that you didn't manipulate, that you kept constant on purpose. And there should be lots and lots of constant factors. Once you've done that, you will have completed your introduction. So you have all of your factors that are deliberately held constant. Then we have the materials and method section. The materials is simply a list of all of the materials that you used for the practical. And then the method is a list of numbered steps in order of the steps that you followed to complete the experiment. And it's written in past tense and third person. So if you read this, it says, the equipment was collected and set up neatly at an empty desk. The measuring cylinders, forceps and mortar and pestle were rinsed with tap water one of the fresh one centimetre liver samples was ground. So you can see that it's written in past tense. And an important part of the method is this part here. It says your experiment should be able to be repeated from the detail that you provide. So there should be enough detail here so that someone can read it and understand exactly what you did and they could repeat your experiment. The last part of the method is this part here, explain how you negotiated the role of each member in your team. So you need to say what you did and what your partner or partners did so that we can see that you had a role to play in the experiment and that it wasn't just your partner that was doing all of the work. 
The next section is the results section. In the results section, you need to have a table of results. So you can see here, this is a table of results for this student's experiment. And then after that, you'll need to have a graph. Now this student hand drew their graph and submitted it separately. So in a moment, I'll show you what their graph looked like. The final part that they did is to write a brief description of what the results show, not why. You can see over here, it says, state and explain your results without making any conclusions. So we talk about what the pattern of results are, but not why that happened. So for this student, it says that it can be con concluded that the ground samples produced more bubbles than the fresh cubes. Uh, and that's what happened, but not why. So that's the important part about the results section. And now here you can see the graph that this student has drawn. Um, it's hand drawn on graph paper. Importantly, they've put the dependent variable on the y axis and the manipulated variable or the independent variable on the x axis. So to help you work that out, you can use dry mix. And the interesting thing for this experiment was that their variable on the x-axis was not numerical. It was just whether the, it, the sample was a cube or whether it had been ground up. And so because of that, they can't draw a line graph with a line of best fit. They can only draw a bar graph or a histogram, which you see here. Normally in your experiments, you have numerical data on the y-axis and the x-axis. And when you have numerical data on both axes, you always draw a line graph with points and a line of best fit. So bear that in mind when you're plotting your graph. I think it's best to do a hand-drawn graph because it helps you to practice those skills. And also sometimes in Excel, the graph that it spits out is not uh, exactly what you're after and can miss some of the important information. So back to our practical report. That's our results section. The last section is probably the most important section. It's the discussion where we evaluate our experiment. And it's where we do the following. First of all, we distinguish between the terms precision and accuracy. And as you've seen, there's another video about precision and accuracy, which you can refer to to help you write that section. You also need to identify any sources of random and systematic error in your experiment. Now, there will be lots of sources of random error. The best place to look for your sources of random error is any of your constant factors. Remember in the introduction, you list constant factors. Uh, here's an example, um, the amount, temperature and concentration of the hydrogen peroxide solution. So that is something that they were using in their practical. That needed to have the same amount, the same temperature and the same concentration. Now it's quite possible that those things were not kept constant and so therefore they are possible sources of random error. Um, so you need to identify sources of random error and basically any time you measure something, it's a source of random error uh, because it could be out by a tiny amount. Um, once you've listed lots of sources of random error, you can talk about the importance of sample size. The importance of sample size in an experiment. Let's have a look for where this student has talked about sample size. Uh, whereabouts are we? Here we go. Sample size. They're talking about their random errors here. Random error, systematic error here. Okay, here we go. Although random errors can never be fully eliminated, their effect can be minimized by increasing the sample size and improving preparation and practical skills. Mainly, increasing sample size can decrease the effect of random error. That's a very important point. All right, systematic error, that's the other type. Systematic error is errors that affect the accuracy of your results. 
and it commonly occurs when there is faults with the equipment that affect all results. For example, they've said in this experiment it could have been the stopwatch used to time the experiment may have been uncalibrated, timing more or less than one minute. So if there's an error there, that would be systematic and affect the whole experiment. Then we've talked about the way to identify systematic errors is to repeat the entire experiment. So that's this part here, the importance of repeating an experiment. Systematic errors can be identified by doing the experiment again on another day at another time with different conditions and materials. Okay, so the last part of your discussion is to look at strengths, weaknesses and improvements to the design of the experiment. Now, what we don't want to see in that section is a strength is that you worked well with your partner. It's not about how you worked with your partner. A strength is not that you enjoyed the experiment. This evaluation is about the strengths of the design of the experiment. How was the experiment designed well in terms of achieving the purpose of the experiment. Was it a well-designed experiment or were there some areas where it could have been designed better to achieve the purpose better? So you need to think about some strengths and weaknesses. For example, here a strength of this experiment included using cubes from the same liver and same potato, uh, using detergent to help show the reaction rates, and differences between multiple tests. So that's some examples of strengths. If we look at weaknesses, uh, whereabouts are we with weaknesses? Weaknesses of the experiment, uh, due to limited time allocated to undertake individual experiments, the samples were prepared inaccurately, so it's a weakness. Each test was only performed once, so that's a weakness because you couldn't provide an average. There was also a limited supply of hydrogen peroxide, which resulted in using a previously prepared solution. So there are some examples of some weaknesses in the design of the experiment. So you need to think about your own practical and think about what were you aiming to do and how was the experiment designed well to achieve that and how could it be improved. For each weakness that you suggest, you need to suggest an improvement of how it could be done better if you did it again. Finally is a conclusion. A conclusion, you simply state whether or not your hypothesis was supported and explain reasons why this is the case. So in this experiment, the hypothesis was supported and the reason for that is because there is a larger sample size when the cube is ground up. So that's what, uh, sorry, a larger surface area when the cube is ground up. And that's what this student concluded in this experiment. You need to think about your practical. Was the hypothesis supported? If so, why is that the case? If not, why is that the case? Finally is your bibliography. If you've used any external sources to provide figures or some of the research in your practical, you can state those at the end. So that's the practical report. And I hope this helps with your writing of your own.